Hey everyone, this is Nick and Elementary OS 7 is finally here. It took a year and a half between OS 6 and OS 7 and a lot has changed in the Linux desktop space since then. So is OS 7 enough of a leap forward to make me abandon GNOME and KDE and go back to my first Linux distro love? Well, we're gonna take a look at what's new and you'll have to wait until the end of the video to know whether I'm switching back or not. But you won't have to wait for this segue to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Safing. Safing makes the Portmaster an open source tool to take back control of your internet connection. It's free of charge and it lets you see every connection every application makes. And it lets you act on these connections by blocking ads and trackers, malware, not safe for work stuff or scams with auto-blocking capabilities and even the ability to use a DNS provider of your choice. You can, of course, create your own rules globally or per application. Portmaster is available as a DEB or an RPM package. It's in the AUR, or you can also install it on Windows. Using it is free of charge and they have paid tiers, starting at three euros per month to support the development, or 9.9 euros per month if you want the total package, including the SPN, which is a VPN on steroids that uses a different IP address for every connection, so you're truly impossible to track. So click the link in the description to download the Portmaster. Okay, let's start with a few basic details about Elementary OS 7. It's based on Ubuntu 22.04.1, which is about a year old at that point, it's an LTS release, so don't expect the very latest packages in the repos or the latest kernel and drivers. Elementary OS 7 will get the hardware enablement stack as Ubuntu releases it, so it will get more hardware support over time and newer kernels, but a bleeding edge distro, this is not. It still uses its own desktop environment called Pantheon and its own applications developed for Elementary OS and it is still available for free, or you can pay what you want to get it. The code name this time around is Horus. And you know me, I'm a 40k fanboy, so I have to call it. Heresy detected. Okay, nerdy jokes aside, let's look at what's new. Installing OS 7 isn't different from installing OS 6. The installer looks the same and feels the same. You still get a few changes here and there, like less invasive messages to tell you to plug in your device, for example. You will get a recap page before installing that will let you know what to expect and also warn you about installing in a VM because obviously it's not the same experience as a real install. Which is why every time I review a distro or a desktop environment, I always install it on a real laptop because a distro first look or test run on a VM is completely meaningless. But also I lied, sometimes I do record stuff from a VM, but I have tested it before on a real device. The installer will also auto-detect if you try and click using the right mouse button and allow you to change to a left-handed configuration. There's a new page letting you connect to the internet if you're not already connected, and that's about it. Still no partitioning, you can do it using Gparted, but the installer doesn't have these capabilities. The onboarding process added a few things as well, like the ability to select the auto dark and light theme, depending on the time of day, or to configure automatic updates, but that's about it. Nothing really changed here, but also nothing needed to change. It was one of the most user-friendly and easy to understand install and onboarding process, and it's still the case today. Now, in terms of look and feel, there's no two ways about it. It looks identical to Elementary OS 6.1. You still have the top panel and the dock, the theme is the same, you have the same accent colors and the same dark mode, no noticeable changes here. The only thing are the icons, which might look identical to the previous release, but they've actually been tweaked or redone, so they all follow a more coherent size and shape. So you shouldn't have tall icons sitting next to your squat square icons in your dock. Small changes have been done here and there on the toolbar icons as well, but generally the art style is identical. It's colorful, it's a little bit 3D and a little bit skeuomorphic, and I kinda like it. I think it passed the point where it looked old, all the way to circle back to now that it feels fresh compared to all the flat and pretty bland design languages that we've had on mobile phones and desktop for the past 10 years. 
The general theme is also identical, even though some applications were moved to GTK4, like the calculator, the sideload app, the music player, the shortcuts list, or the onboarding app. The porting efforts are still underway, and the bigger apps like the file manager, for example, are still GTK3, and they will be ported over to GTK4 over the lifecycle of OS 7. Which hopefully should also bring these apps more features, because yes, elementary OS sort of follows the same model as KD Neon. You have a stable base that doesn't really evolve over the lifecycle of the distro, but the desktop and the applications themselves get updates consistently. So not exactly a rolling release, maybe a, a dragging release, because it, it sort of doesn't roll, but it still moves. I don't know, we need a name for that. So now let's talk App Center. That thing was miles ahead of the competition when OS 6 released. It looked better, it was faster, it had more information about apps, it let you pay what you want for applications or get them for free, it was just great. When a company like System76 decides to take the App Center instead of GNOME software for their distro that they actually ship on devices they sell to customers, you know App Center was doing something right. Well, if you don't count the fact that App Center did not come with FlatHub or with access to the various apps in the Ubuntu repos, that was not really great. Since then, though, GNOME Software and Discover have caught up, and so OS 7 implements a few changes of its own. First, the store is now responsive and works better on small screen sizes. It's good for tiling it on one side of the screen, but it also means it sorta of looks weird, like with the search bar that feels way too big at regular window sizes. The header bar was redone with a permanent updates button instead of using the installed apps tab and a settings icon to enable auto updates. In application pages, you now get bigger screenshots, something that's still an issue in GNOME software where they're way too small and they're surrounded by bright accent colors and even captions to describe what the app can do. It looks good and it's a joy to use on a laptop with super precise touchpad gestures that follow your fingers as they move on the touchpad. OS 7 also adds a few mentions on app pages, like an outdated tag if an app hasn't been updated for OS 7. You'll still be able to run it because it uses Flatpak, so apps from OS 6 will run on OS 7 and vice versa, but it's an indication that the developer hasn't yet followed through with the release. And you will also get more update notes with up to five versions, so you know if the app is actively maintained or not. And now for the not so good stuff on the App Center. First, still no flat pack by default, you have to add it manually. You still get that small text when your search returns nothing with a link to FlatHub. And the sideload app will let you add FlatHub graphically, but it still sucks that there's no simple one checkbox option to add it at install. And also no graphical way to access Ubuntu apps or Ubuntu libraries from the Ubuntu repos, which is still super dumb. You will need to use the command line to install anything from these repos. But also I guess that means that you don't get snaps on the desktop, which is good. Third, the app pages are now way less detailed than the ones you will get in GNOME software or Discover. No list of permissions for Flatpak apps, no age ratings, no safety indication, no details about the license, and the app update info generally seems less complete than on GNOME software. So yeah, App Center used to have the edge over GNOME software and Discover, hands down it was a better experience. And nowadays, the app's UI is better, but the information it displays and the quantity of apps it lets users install out of the box is just not good. It's not a bad experience because you can fix those issues, but it's just not the best and other app stores have just caught up and surpassed it. Now, speaking of applications, that brings us to sideloading, which basically means getting an app from FlatHub and installing it manually. You can still do that just by downloading an app from the FlatHub website, for example. You'll get a graphical window and this will add FlatHub to your sources and then you will have access to all FlatHub apps in the App Center afterwards. Now, once you added FlatHub, you won't get a dialogue for each app you install from it, telling you that it's not curated. You just get a small tag in the apps page, so there's less friction. Apps installed from FlatHub will not reflect the elementary OS theme by default, so they will look out of place and they will not follow your accent color, because there is no standard there yet either, 
and they might not follow your dark mode preference either, depending on the app. For example, LibreOffice doesn't. And sure, adding FlatHub graphically is very easy, but you just can't force users to use a very small app ecosystem, like the one Elementor US has, which has no access to apps users actually want to use, like an Office Suite or Firefox. Well, okay, maybe not Firefox, because it seems that not many people use that anymore, apart from me, but you get my point. Basically, users need to have the apps that they will always want to install available. Elementor iOS, by default, has no other web browsers available and no Office Suites. It's dumb. Now, let's look at the updates to the applications. First, you get GNOME Web, ported to GTK4 with a much faster WebKit engine. It supports creating web apps that will show up in your Elementor iOS menu. And for me, it's night and day with the previous version because I can finally play YouTube videos on it, which never worked before on Epiphany or GNOME Web for me on any device. It is still extremely smooth with touchpad gestures to go back and forward and it's now a pretty good browser, I must say, apart from extension support, which is being worked on but isn't really there yet. The mail client also received a lot of love. Now you still need to use the online accounts feature to add your email account. And on a side note, these online accounts on Elementor iOS are super bare bones. You don't get the option to add a Google account, a Microsoft account, a Nextcloud account, or basically it's just IMAP or CalDAV, and you have to enter all the details manually. Gnome and KDE have them beat by a large, large margin. Now, once you added your account, you're treated with a refreshed UI that should make its way to other elementary apps in the future. The icons of the toolbar are now part of the content and not split in a separate header bar, which makes the app look a bit cleaner and less heavy. Now, Office 365 accounts will now also appear in the unified inbox and the app is a lot more stable. On OS 6, it crashed and froze and failed to display email all the time, but it's much, much better in OS 7. Still, it lacks a few key features, like the ability to create labels or folders, or to handle signatures or out-of-office messages. At least it's now usable, because it's stable and it doesn't crash all the time, but it still will be unsuitable for anyone who needs an office mail client, and not just a personal one. The Tasks app was pretty bare bones in OS 6. It was also a bit buggy, but now it's much improved. You can create new task lists offline and they will sync to your CalDAV account when you get back online, if you have such an account configured. And tasks that reach their due date will now send notifications if you want. The file manager now lets you select folders by clicking on them, when before a single click would open them. You can turn on that option in the context menu. And that's about all the changes in the file manager. It's still super simple, and a lot of people will probably find it too basic for their needs. The music app is the one that changed the most. It's been rewritten, and it's no longer a music collection manager. It is just a player with a queue. You just add songs, and they play, and that's it. No management of albums, artists, genres, or stuff like that. It looks beautiful, and it's fast, and it's fluid, and it does what it's supposed to do play music files. But if you wanted a collection organizer that can rip CDs and just organize everything with editing tags, then that's not it, and you will have to find another alternative. Personally, I don't have a local music collection anymore, and I haven't had for ages. I'm ashamed to say I moved on to music streaming a long while ago. But for people who do have a need for this app, yeah, it's a downgrade compared to this collection manager that was previously available. Code, the text editor slash small IDE, also got a few updates with a full height project bar, moving the icons that were on that panel to the right of the window. It also now supports your system-wide dark preference, instead of only having manual options for light and dark theme. They added the find tools to the applications menu, and they now support regular expressions, and selecting some text in a file will pre-fill the find tool with that text. Hiding and showing panels is also now done from the apps menu and hidden folders will appear in your project tree automatically. The terminal also now can follow your system-wide dark or light mode, but it lost its transparency by default, which I'm sad about. But it gained the ability to create custom color profiles, which is pretty great. And finally, Archive Manager and Document Viewer, both apps pulled from GNOME, received updates to their version 43 with better dark mode support and flat pack portals. 
Evolutionary changes all around, nothing here will blow your mind or revolutionize how you used your system, compared to elementary OS or even compared to GNOME. Now let's finish this with the settings. First, you now get power profiles with a performance mode, power save mode and balanced mode. Performance mode generally only appears on devices with a dedicated GPU and on my laptop it's not there. And you also cannot switch profiles from the power indicator, which sucks, you'll have to go into the settings themselves. But it's still good to have these available. Hot corners are also more configurable in the multitasking preferences. You can now execute a custom command when activating one of these. The keyboard shortcuts panel also is much better, letting you reset something to the default easily. And the shortcuts app can now be launched like any other application. More importantly though, you can now easily set the super key to open the multitasking view instead of either the shortcuts or the application menu. And I still wish that either the application menu or the multitasking view had a system-wide search feature to look for files, folders, applications, web pages, akin to what you can find in GNOME's activity view or in KDE's overview. Not having that feature on elementary OS is insane. You also get cleaner printer settings with the ability to clear the print queue per printer and it shows ink levels much more legibly. You also get a new option in the security panel to prevent new USB devices from being mounted when the computer is locked. Okay, so OS 7, is it enough for me to switch back? Well, let me be brutally honest. OS 7 feels amazing. The touchpad gestures are really great for navigating between apps, but also inside of apps with the ability to go back from settings panels or from the app center or in the web browser, it's so super smooth and responsive and it's on X11, not on Wayland. OS 7 is as polished as ever. Every detail is nicely crafted and it looks great and the attention to design, wording and placement is palpable. But what elementary OS offers is now compared against much more matured versions of GNOME and KDE which have both surpassed it in almost every single aspect. These desktops have a better app ecosystem now. They both support Wayland. Their default apps have more features. They are both more configurable, even GNOME with its extensions. And they move faster on updates as well. And there's still the boneheaded decisions. No easy way to add Flathub in one click. No graphical access to Ubuntu repos by default. No way to add tray icons simply. No full system-wide search for files, apps, folders, or web pages. What were minor annoyances in elementary OS 6, because other desktops just didn't really do things better, are now roadblocks for me. And sure, OS 7 will absolutely be a wonderful upgrade for elementary OS users. It will be amazing. But it's not enough to make me switch back from GNOME and KDE to elementary OS. Sure, I'll miss the polish and I'll miss the advanced touchpad gestures that they have inside of applications that GNOME and KDE do not have, but still, it's not enough to tempt me back. But I can appreciate all the effort and all the time that went into crafting such a polished experience that, honestly, no other distro still can match. So I'll be keeping my eye on OS 7, I'll look at the updates that they add, I'll see if the contention points that are there for me are fixed in the future, and maybe I'll reconsider. But for now, I'll stick to GNOME and to KDE. And I'll stick to this segue to today's sponsor. If you need a new laptop or desktop to run Linux on, stop buying Windows devices and trying to slap Linux on it. Buy something that supports Linux out of the box, from today's sponsor, Tuxedo. They are based in Germany, but they ship worldwide and they have a huge range of devices that should fit every price point and every need, whether you're looking for a small affordable NUC or laptop or a very high-end workstation. They have options for everything. They have multiple configuration options. You can open them, repair them and upgrade them. You can install any distro you like on them and you can basically customize them all you want with a custom keyboard layout on the keys of your laptop, a custom logo or no logo at all if you don't like branding. So if you need a new device, you want to support Linux's development and you want to make sure that Linux runs great on it, click the link in the description below and get yourself a Tuxedo device. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications. And if you didn't, you can also, well, dislike it and tell me why in the comments. 
And if you want to support what I do and the channel, you'll find plenty of links below to my social networks, PayPal, super thanks, YouTube memberships, Patreon memberships. Just click on whatever you like or just buy some merch. There's some merch now as well. You decide. In the meantime, thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.